Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Paul tells us in verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching, he says, they were not in persuasive words of wisdom. He, I'm not a smooth talker, he says, but they were in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God. Now, this is really important for our faith. You know, when, when, you, when your faith rests on some eloquent speaker and just, just that, you know, pizzazz that they have, that flashy way. It's all great until you hit some rocky spots in life. But when your faith rests on the power of God, and you're taught the power of God is where, the, where our source is, you know, that you can rely. Does God have power to help us? Can he rescue us? When, you, when your faith is established on that fact that the Lord is, is almighty, he can do things no matter what the circumstance is, then when stuff gets tough, those eloquent words that can't rescue, the power of God can. And Paul, he wanted them to know it was the power of God that was, like he was interested in them coming to know. His power, the power of his spirit. You know, God's spirit is so good at helping us if we let him. But I've shared this before. How many times do folks say, yeah, pastor, I felt like uh, there's some little voice inside saying I should stop and help that guy who's broke down on the side of the road over there by Costco. And I'm just waiting for the praise report. So, so you stopped? How did it go? And, oh, no, I didn't stop. I was just calling you because I felt guilty I didn't stop. Maybe you could go out to Costco and help him. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. The, the Spirit of God is whispering to you when you pass by to stop. See, when we listen, I just got to share, uh, uh, our young man named Lauren uh, lives right around the corner from us, one of, one of the young men that kind of grew up in our house a lot and, uh, with our son Daniel, and Lauren had this little red Miata, and Daniel always wanted it, but uh, Lauren moved away to the mainland, he put up for sale, but put up a real high price, and it was out of Daniel's, you know, reach at that time, so he sold it. And we see it in the neighborhood. So we knew it was sold to, to right around our neighborhood. Daniel actually found out it was sold to the guy about four houses up from us. And it just sat in the driveway all the time. And Daniel finally went on. He, he got a job. He saved up some money. He got a little black Miata convertible. It's like, is it the same year, Daniel? 95. 95. So these are not new. So, so, so the, just the little, the little car, you know, and he, he gets it and he's all happy. But in, inside, he always wanted Lauren's red Miata. Now, Lauren just came back from the mainland. He's been gone and uh, he just got back this week. And so he comes over to the house and there's the red Miata and the black Miata in our driveway. Luke is driving the black one. Daniel's driving the red one. And, and you know, Lauren has already heard that Daniel somehow got the Miata. So he wants to know how that it came about. And he's talking to me. He's, he's kind of on this exploring all these different, you know, philosophies of life. And, you know, college age, young mind, like trying all the different drugs and stuff and checking stuff out and wondering about life. And, and he says, you know, it's really cool that Daniel has my old car. I said, well, do you know how it came about that he got that? he goes, well, he said something like he was washing the black one at the bottom of the driveway and the red one went driving by and he felt like God said, stop washing your car right now and go up the street and talk to the guy and, and ask him if he wants to sell the car. I said, do you know what happened? And he says, yeah, I heard that he, he stopped washing his car and he went up the street. And I was thinking, this is the coolest thing. When you have a son that gets that little inkling of God telling you to do something, and he does it. So he went up the street. He, he goes, excuse me. The guy is just getting out of the Miata. He says, do you ever want to sell that car? And the guy goes, he reaches in. He goes, I just went and bought these for sale signs to put it for sale. Like right now. He goes, I bought it for my girlfriend. We broke up, and I'm just going to get rid of it. And he goes, well, that was my friend Lauren's car, and I've always wanted it. And um, 
And I don't know why. I just felt like I was supposed to come ask you right now. He goes, don't put the signs in the window. I'll buy it. How much do you want? And he, my son got to save like $1,000 off of what he paid for it because my son knew what he paid. He was like, I already know what you paid because Lauren told me. So, so he couldn't like snow him or anything. He's like, all right, I just want to get rid of it. Here. And so he sold it to him. Dan was so happy. I got the car. And I'm telling Lauren, Lauren, you know how he got that car, right? He felt that little voice. So many times we have that little voice inside telling us to do something. And some of us have learned that it goes well when you listen. But, but not just listen, you obey what the voice is telling you. You do that thing that God's just putting on your heart to do. And it can be such a simple little thing. But you know those simple little acts of obedience lead to the blessings that the Lord has for us. When we just obey. It's, it's such a simple thing to teach but for some reason in our culture, it's a hard thing to get people to practice. I mean, they just resist the idea of, well, you want me to trust a God that I can't see? The God you say that made everything and knows everything and has all power? I'm like, yeah, that's what I want you to do. Because look, look, look at the option. It's trust you with your finite brain or me with mine. I mean, we don't really have all knowledge. We don't know all those little... I mean. My son didn't know that the guy just went to buy the signs to put the thing for sale. But God did. And he didn't even have to fill them out. They were still blank. He could return them. You know, get his money back. And he got the car sold. And he was happy. And my son was happy. And here's Lauren. It's a testimony to him of just listening. Because he says, wow, that's really cool that he heard that and he listened. I said, Lauren, God's been trying to talk to you for a long time. But you got to do what my son did. You have to listen. You have to listen. You have to do. Hear and obey. It's, it's such a simple message. Well, Paul says, I came to you and I preached to you, but not with, with, with these, you know, persuasive, super smooth preaching. He said, I just preached to you with, the, with words of wisdom. Words of wisdom means the application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. You can... It, wisdom is different than knowledge. I know in our society we make knowledge as king. Everybody wants knowledge. I don't care for knowledge as king. I'd rather have wisdom above knowledge. And you ask me why. I say, well, it's like this. Your, your car is, um, has steam coming out of, the, out of the hood, you know? And you can smell that f sweet kind of smell in the air. And you go, I think I have a, a leak of radiator fluid. You know, it's kind of misting out hot steam. And you could know that you got a problem. That's knowledge. Wisdom is the application. Now, wisdom is, what do I do about the steam coming out of the hood? Because there's some people, they see the steam coming out of the hood, and they go, oh, I'll just drive to town and get it looked at. And they look at the needle on the dash, and it says hi on the temperature. And they drive the engine completely out of water. I only got 15, 20 miles to go. I'll just drive it to town. What happens to the engine? Overheats, seizes up, right? Now, they had knowledge that there was a problem, but they didn't have the wisdom of what to do about that. I mean, a wise man would know, pull over. Find out where the leak is. If it's bad, don't go any farther. Get the parts and fix it on the side of the road if you have to. Don't blow your whole engine just because you didn't want to have a little stop, right? I mean, that's wisdom. Give me wisdom any day over knowledge. Paul says, I preach for you to have this wisdom of God. I want you to know what to do. Now, that's my kind of preacher. A preacher wants you to know how to do it. Wants you to know what, what God would have you do. That's, a, that's, a, that's solid. That's what we need. And he says, and my, my preaching was with the, with, with, the, with, with the words of wisdom and with the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God's Spirit. Now, see, there is power in God's Spirit. Some people, they just, they like to say things like, oh, you know, back then, that was for then. God did those miracles, you know. Like, how many believe that God did miracles with Paul and those guys? You know, you read the book of Acts, Peter... Aaron kind of stole my thunder. He did the study on Ananias and Sapphira a couple weeks ago. 
in Acts 5 about how Peter, you know, the, the couple comes and they, they, they bring the proceeds from the land that they sold, but they didn't bring the whole amount. They held some back. But they wanted to make it look like, they, hey, this is what we got from our land. We're giving it all to the church. And Peter's, you know, the, it was the husband came in first. And he, he gives the money. He says, he says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You know, the land was yours. I mean, it's, even after it's sold in Jewish culture, it's still, it's like you're buying a land lease. So it stays that person's only until the year of Jubilee and then it reverts back to the original owner. So, you know, you, you, you sold the lease, and, but you're like acting like you're hot. you've saved some in your pocket, but this is all I got from the land. I want to look like a good guy, like I'm giving everything I got from my land sale. And here you go to the apostles, and Peter says, you're lying. Now what happened to that guy, since you guys just had this with Aaron, what happened to the fellow Ananias? The Lord zotzed him, man. He dropped dead. And they took him and they took him out and buried him. And a couple hours later, his wife came in. And Peter says, tell me, is this the price you, you sold the land for, such and such a price? And she said, yes, that's the price. And, she, and Peter says, the young men who buried your husband, whose feet are at the door, they'll, they'll bury you now as well for lying to the Holy Ghost. You put God to a test. And she drops dead. Now, you guys probably read this in Acts 5. And great fear fell among the whole church. I bet. <laughs> you know? And it says, and none of the people, they held the apostles in high esteem, but nobody dare associate with them. They're like, man, I don't want to hang out with those guys. What if they go, and you, you lied about this or whatever. I mean, we'd all get zots, wouldn't we? He's like, so they, they were like, wow, respect, mass respect, but I ain't going to get near you, you know. Just you guys stay over there. And, and so they... You know, but I don't know. I asked Aaron, do you got to verse 16 of Acts 5? Turn to Acts 5 real quick. Just to show you the power of God's Spirit. After that happened, verse 12 says, And at the hands of the apostles many signs, Acts 5, 12, many signs and wonders were taking place amongst the people. And they were all in one accord in Solomon's portico, but none of the rest dare associate with the apostles. However, the people held them in high esteem, and, the, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly being added to their number, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets, and they laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any of them. Now, why did they want his shadow to fall, Peter's shadow, to fall on them? You guys know what happened, right? You read ahead, verse 16. And the people from the city of the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted and with unclean spirits, and they were all being, what? Healed. Man, they just went, if we could just get Peter's shadow to fall on these sick people. The power of God was so present with these apostles that they... They just went, line the sick. Wait, your son's on this side of the street? That means the shadow's over here, right? Put him on this side. Everybody, here he comes. Can you just see them shoving the sick people over to one side of the road so they can get him ready? And here, here comes Peter just walking by. His shadow touches him. The guy pops up. Shadow touches him, pops up. You know, the guy that's possessed, he gets freed from the evil spirit. I mean, this would be pretty cool. The power of God was with them. Now, some people say that was only for back then. God did miracles because they needed to get the church started. It was like a little spiritual boost. Well, we don't have that today. He doesn't do that anymore. I, I, I'm, here to, I'm here to unequivocally tell you that's a lie. The same Spirit of God that worked back then still works miracles today. He still frees people today. He still heals people. How many of you guys have prayed for someone who was sick and they, and they, and they recovered? You go, oh, okay. But see, some people say to me, well, I don't know, you know, like that's not like really a miracle miracle. I mean, that, that could have just been natural amount of time for the healing to take. Has any of you seen, witnessed a, a prayer what was given for someone sick and they got instantly healed? Or physically, you know, God touched them? I have. In fact, 
the fun part is the longer that you're in the Lord, the more you realize it's not you. Only the Lord that does it. But if you leave room for the Lord, I say leave lots of room for the Lord because he's really good at his job. The more room you leave for him to do his stuff, he does stuff. And it's, it just blows my mind, the things that he does. When I read this story, I go, I mean, how many of you believe that this really happened? The, the shadow of Peter made people get well. I'll tell you that here's one thing that some folks that, you know, like an analytical type um, investigator did a study on the book of Acts and just to look at, because he's trained to assess facts and if things really happen and how, you know, and they think, those analytical guys, they think in a different, like I call it backdoor thinking. You know, they're like, if this really happened, then not just the guy that happened to or the, or the narrator will say something about it, but it will have an effect on other people. And you'll get their witness, their testimonies. And that's what those investigators do. They go and they find the testimonies of different people. And, they, and they, they're, it's weird how they deduce things. But let me show you what they would do. There, there was a fellow who did this to the book of Acts. Read the next verse of Acts 5, verse 17. It says, but the high priest rose up along with his associates and, and, and that, that is the sect of the Sadducees. Now, if you don't know the group of Sadducees, the, the Sadducean uh, group, easy way to remember, they are sad you see. And the reason they are sad you see is because they don't believe in any resurrection. They don't believe in anything supernatural that can't be explained by natural means. Anything that God would do in the power of his spirit, they go, we don't believe in it. Do we have people like that today? We have Sadducees today. I'm just, they just don't call themselves that. But they would be back in, that, in, 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 in this day, they would be called the Sadducean group. And it says, and they were filled with what? Jealousy. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in public jail. And during the night, it says, an angel of the Lord came. He opened the gates of the prison and took them out. He said, go stand and speak in the to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. And upon hearing this, they entered the temple at daybreak, and they began to teach. Now, when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, and even the senate, the sons of Israel, sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came, they didn't find them in the prison. And they reported back, and they said, we found the prison house locked quite securely. The guards were standing at the doors. But when we opened it up, we didn't find anyone inside. Now, when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed as to what had happened and what would come about of this. And someone came and reported, the men who you put in prison are now standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. And the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence. For they were afraid of the people, for they that they might be stoned. They were they were worried. Man, we're gonna get a beating from these people, because these people high. They, now here's what the forensic guy does. He goes. He goes. Wait a minute. If this story really happened, were there any other witnesses? And what was their take about the whole story? And ironically, he writes about these very guys right here, the Sadducean guys. It must have happened. You don't go arrest guys and have them beaten and thrown in jail if there's not some reason. And by the way, that part's recorded in secular history. That these guys made such a stir, it's not, you don't even need the Bible to, show, to prove this happened. You can read the history books and they, and they write about that they, <laughs> they had these prisoners that they locked up and somehow... They got there the next morning, and the prison house is completely locked secure. The guards are still in their spot, and the guys got out. The unexplainable prison escape. Except we know what happened. An angel just went, guys, come on. And they go right on preaching. Now, you guys have the red axe. You know they brought them before the council, told them, we gave you strict orders not to do this anymore. And they said, in verse 29, Peter answered in the apostles, they said, we must obey God rather than men. And the God of the fathers that raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on the cross, he is the one who God exalted to his right hand as a prince, as a savior, 
to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. To the ones who obey God, what do you get as a gift? The Holy Spirit. If you're just willing to obey, God will give you His Spirit. And His Spirit can lead you. His Spirit can guide you. His Spirit can comfort you. When you're having a really bad day, you know one of the sweetest things about just being willing to, to, to obey the Lord is that His Spirit comforts you. And Peter, Peter witnesses with the apostles. They get arrested for preaching and they get thrown in jail. And then the, they get released. Now, by the way, does, does this happen ever again to Peter? Oh, remember the one time he gets thrown in jail? And he thinks it's a dream. The angel says, get up, let's go. And the doors keep opening in front of him and then closing behind them. And Peter goes all the way out. Peter thought, this is a really good dream. I'm being escorted by an angel out of the... And then he gets all the way out into the hills outside of Jerusalem. And a cold wind hits him and he wakes up. He was like a sleepwalker, you know, or whatever. I mean, he's like, wait a minute. This isn't a dream. I'm really out of the jail. You know, and... God's Spirit has power to do stuff. Don't think God can't open jail doors. I mean, does that... God goes, I don't know how to pick locks. It's really beyond me, right? <laughs> Nothing to the Lord. So here, this happens to them. Well, you know what happened to Paul? Paul, when he went on to Ephesus, right after he founded that church at Corinth, went back to, to, to his home church and then back out, and he gets to Ephesus. And you know what? He's there in Ephesus in chapter 19 of this of Acts, and he's there, it says, for two years. And all who heard, it says, the, the word of the Lord, all the way throughout Asia, they all, Jews and Greeks alike, heard the word of the Lord to such an extent, this is Acts 19, verse 11, and God was performing extraordinary miracles at the hands of Paul. So that even the handkerchiefs, or the aprons that Paul like poor Paul, he's making tents, he's got an apron on, he's sweaty, you know, he's in that Mediterranean region, he's got, he's got his handkerchief, he wipes his forehead, I could just see him, you know, I, I think of Evie Hill, this black preacher I loved to listen to when I was a young man, he said, the Lord said, and he grab out his hanky, whip it out, <laughs> wipe his sweat off his brow, poor guy, he always had to preach in a, in a full three-piece suit and a tie and everything in the, in the south, or really hot. And here's Paul. He's like, hot. Man, so in his tents, wipes off, sets his hanky down, and they would come and they would steal it. And they, I'm not kidding you. Read the next part of this chapter. They would take his handkerchief. They think, well, Paul touched this. We have proof. It's got his sweat on it. You know what they did with his sweaty handkerchief? They took it to the sick people and they laid it on them. Because they go, Paul touched this, right? So, it's got his touch, man. It's got like power from God on it. And they touch the sick. And you know what happened to the sick people? It's like Peter's shadow. Poof, they pop up. People are possessed. Be gone. Little sweaty rag. Bing. Demon digs out. And they're like, this works great. You know, poor Paul couldn't hold on to a handkerchief. His apron. They'd steal his apron. Paul wore this, man. Throw it on him. And I love this. The word of the Lord spread mightily so that even if the handkerchief was put on the body of a sick person or diseased person, they, they would be healed. The evil spirits, verse 12, it says, would leave and go out from them just from that little handkerchief. Now, who believes God could do that? I mean, is that like God goes, that's too big. I can't do hankies. I can do. Right? No, to the Lord's nothing. He goes, like, this is easy. But see, if I taught you that we have a really powerful God that could do anything, and you learn your faith like that, and you hit a crossroad or a bump in the road in your faith that's hard, but you have been grounded in the power of His Spirit, how will you fare compared to the person who just heard some fancy, eloquent preaching and didn't really learn the power of the cross? didn't learn the power of God's Spirit. How, how do they fare when they hit those hard times in life? How, how many of you know people that used to be in the faith but say, yeah, I was, but then I had a hard spell and I'm, I, I don't do that anymore? Are they out there? 
Yeah. It's because they weren't grounded on the thing what Paul said, I determined that you would know. Christ and Him crucified. And the power of His Spirit. If you know those things, you're going to be able to hold fast even in a dark society. I mean, corrupt. The, Cor the Corinthians are in a really bad place. And yet Paul's going, I need you to know this. God's power and His Son crucified. And you'll make it. That's what we need today. How many think it's getting darker in our society when you look at I tell you, I, I, I feel like I'm a, a, a parrot. I'm just here to parrot what Paul said. I determine, Izzy determines, I want you to know Christ crucified and I want you to know the power of his spirit. Because it, it can get really dark, but if you're holding on to the light, you got the source of his power, you're going to make it. And it only takes that little bit of light to see your way in a really dark place. So we need to stick to that. Now next week, well, it's the next paragraph of Corinthians. I didn't go too far, I told you. But I got you a really good background because now I can shoot through the next couple parts in, in what's coming up and it'll make sense to you because you know kind of the founding of the church and what they were facing. And I'll bring out some more of it as we... Uh, I've reserved the right to finish a few more parts of Acts just to weave them in as we go through the book of Corinthians so you see some really cool things that will strengthen your faith. It's not in cleverness. It's just to bring attention to his power, to his word, so you get it and it sinks in. Because once his word sinks in you, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of what? The word of God. We need God's word planted in our heart to help our faith, just so we can make it. I mean, there's stuff coming against our faith all the time. And we really need that power that his spirit gives us so we can stay strong in these days. So let's pray. And uh, ask the Lord just to, to let these words sink in and minister to what we need. Lord, I pray for anyone here that even as Paul, you had to go to him in the evening, in the night, in a vision and tell him not to be afraid. Lord, I know there's some here that have fears that they're facing and things that are, are causing them great dread. Lord, I just pray that you would give them encouragement from your spirit. That they would come to learn the power of your spirit the strengthening that you give us when we need it, Lord, is beyond any strength of human strength. So, Lord, let us be like Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 40. Let they that would wait upon you, wait upon the Lord, renew their strength and rise up with wings like eagles and run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Lord, may we be those people that put our focus on you and receive your power for our lives to walk the walk that you have set before us. Please, Lord, empower each of us as we go from here with your power, I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. May the power of the Lord truly gird you up this week that you can rely on him. And if you feel that little inkling like God, you know, put, put on your heart to do something, do me a favor, just obey. And then you'll be able to call me and say, hey, pastor, you know, he said to go up the road and there was the car and I did it and then I got the, you know, you'll have the praise report. Whatever the thing is that God told you to do. But you won't have it if you don't listen and obey. You'll go, oh, I think I, I, I probably missed out. And I don't, I, I don't want that for anyone's testimony here. I want you all to be enjoying the fruits of His Spirit, what His Spirit leads us in and guides us in. So you can go, yeah, God is real. I mean, he is, is he real? Does he really direct us? Have any of you ever felt like you're going one direction and you got that little kind of, I call it a little check, a little red light, like, stop, don't go that way. And you're like, I don't know why, but I just don't feel like I'm supposed to turn that way. And you find out that just, you know, you, you get home, you find out that down that road, that's where there was an accident or there was some problem, you know, and you just felt, you just weird. I, I could go that way all the time, but no, not tonight. Just turn the other way. Take the alternative route, you know, and listen. And obey that spirit. And he will protect you. He'll guide you. He, he's good at his job. You know, we're just the ones that need to pull the cotton out of our ears and, you know, get unplugged so we can hear like Jesus. Let those that uh, hear, those who have ears to hear what he say, let them hear what the, the spirit says. May God's spirit help you to hear him this week. 
and you have a great week in the Lord. We'll shine bright for the Lord if we just go like this. What do you want me to do, Lord? I want to be the guy who's listening to you. We get, we get hit with stuff from everywhere else. So it's hard sometimes to hear that still small voice over the roar of this society. So I want to be really disciplined to go, let me hear you. Block out all the other stuff, Lord. If you have to, just you know, make me where I can't hear it, but I hear you. And he can do that for you. And it makes your life so sweet. I, I, I can't tell you how many things he can do when you just go like this. I'm here to hear you, Lord. I, want, I just want you to guide me. Just listening. Just show me. So may you have a blessed week doing that this week. Let's stand, sing a closing song, let you go in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com Mahalo and God bless.